Hello and welcome to Tank and AFE News. My name's Tom and just doing a little midweek update, tank talk, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I've been busy tonight working on the script for the next Tanks of World War II episode, which is on the Char B1 BIS. Hopefully that'll be out this weekend, Saturday or Sunday. Um, that's what I'm aiming for. So cross your fingers. Just depends on how how much time it takes to edit it. So as I was obviously tonight I've been thinking a lot about the, the, the Char B1 BIS and uh Got my little 172 scale model uh, to keep me company while I do. And thinking about the whole idea of tanks with two cannons, you know, a turret mounted one and one in the hull. And why people did this, because it's one of those ideas that just seems really kind of bad um, at first glance. It's like, why not just have one big gun, which is what everybody ended up doing. But of course, tank development is a lot easier to critique looking back than it was for the people who were designing and building these vehicles um, at the time. And of course the 1930s, um, you have to realize that like, tank design was, you know, tanks were only like 20, by the time World War II breaks out, they've only been around for a little, you know, 23 years. Uh, so, you know, that, and believe me, once you get a little older, 20 years does not seem like that long of a stretch of time. And, um, a lot of things can change in that, but it's not a lot of time in terms of the development of of weapon systems in peacetime. Um, things usually develop a lot more slowly in peacetime than they do once the shooting starts in an actual war, because in peacetime you don't really have opportunities to actually get real data information on what works and what doesn't on the battlefield. Um, other than, you know, obviously there were some things like the Spanish Civil War where they were able to get some, glean some information, but for the most part, everybody's still sort of experimenting with a lot of ideas. And, you know, the one, one, one problem they always faced was, you know, as far as arming our tanks, we need guns that can punch through enemy armor. We also need guns that can fire a decent high explosive round. And the whole punchers of the period are, you know, like around an inch and a half, you know, 37 millimeter or so, and that's just not really good enough for throwing a decent high explosive round where you need something more like, you know, traditional field artillery piece where you're talking three inch, you know, 75 millimeter, three inch, that range. So how do you solve that problem? And, you know, different countries sort of came at it different ways. Now, the, the, the two countries in the 30s that are kind of really pushing tank development forward, you know, the Soviet Union and Germany sort of come up with two different uh, solutions. The Germans, of course, come up with the sort of complicated solution, which, aside from the, you know, and actually I didn't even pull this out, uh, aside from the very limited number of these monsters they made, which had two guns and one turret, which that's a whole other idea that most people didn't bother to do, um, they said, well, we'll just have two different tanks. You know, a Panzer III and a Panzer IV. One will have a 37mm gun for punching holes through other tanks. The other one will have a short-barreled 75mm howitzer for trucking HE. Um, you know, most countries would say, why don't you just build one tank that can, you know, you can equip some with one gun and some with the other, but, you know, never mind, Germany's going to do it complicated. The Soviets kind of have probably the most, you know, uh, the simplest uh, solution, which, you know, culminates in the T-34 and the KV, where it's like, we're, we're just going to have a high-velocity three-inch gun, problem solved. You know, the only problem is we're going to shove it into a really cramped two-man turret on the T-34, and crew ergonomics are going to kind of be terrible, you know, until we come out with an enlarged turret a little later, but, you know, so be it. It's one gun that does it all, and of course that, you know, when Operation Barbarossa comes comes around, that that's sort of a shock to the Germans, you know, that that is a much better solution than the sort of... Uh, small caliber hole punchers and howitzers and putting different guns on different tanks. Just have one gun that can do it all. Um, and then, of course, we have the Western Allies, Britain, France, and the United States, who all kind of, at some point, dabble with the idea of a tank that's got both guns, types of guns in them. So, you know, they say, well, why not just do both and we'll stick one in the hull? And that would be be first seen in the Char B1 bis, the French one, and this French tank, it's a funny one, because it's obviously, you look at it, this thing looks like, it looks pretty steampunk, it looks like something from World War One, and it is a 1920s design, basically. It's, it's sort of like a 1920s um, assault gun with a 1930s French turret slapped on top of it, just to sort of try to make it into a real tank. 
Um, but you know, this thing's just, it's, it's, it's not ideal. I mean, it's effective on the 1940 battlefield because it's, the German tanks are so poorly armed and armored, even though they're more modern configuration that this thing still can kind of, uh, uh, kick butt when they do encounter the German tanks, assuming these things don't break down first or some other run out of fuel or all the other problems that plagued French armored forces in that time period. Um, but this would qu very quickly become a fairly obsolete platform because it is a very 1920s tank in conception. Um, almost sort of like a modernized version of the old saint Jean, where you just you basically want this big assault gun thing. Um, oh, this one does have a turret on the top. Um, and that solution of just putting a one-man turret on the top creates just, yes, it's a four-man crew, but it, the, the workload is not distributed very well because, again, you got the commander having to be the loader and gunner. The driver has to be a gunner because the gun has zero traverse, so he has to aim the entire vehicle. Um, it's, it's, it's a weird vehicle, and it's one that sort of the French, you know, it's almost already obsolete by the time they start producing it seriously in the late 30s, but it's kind of what they've got, what they have to work with. They don't have time to go and produce, uh, design something more modern to fill that sort of 30-ton range of, of uh, shard to combat, as they call it. Uh, next, we go across the Atlantic to the United States, and, of course, there it's probably the most famous of the tanks with two guns, the M3 Lee. And this is uh, very much a emergency measure. So, my last little tank talk, we talked about the M2. Um, this is, they sort of take an M2, pull all the machine guns out of the sponsons, chuck a 75 millimeter cannon in, in the corner and move the turret over a little bit. And they designed a new turret. This one, obviously it's a very different turret than the, um, the turret on the M2 looks like a, like an, like an M2 or M3 light tank turret. This one's a cast turret and it was sort of similar in shape to what will, you know, the much larger M4 Sherman tank turret that'll come later, which is being designed, you know, while they're putting this in production, they're already designing the Sherman, because that's what they ultimately want. The Army wants something with a 75 millimeter gun and a fully rotating turret, but they'll make do with this. Um, what's different about this from the Sharp one bis is that, whereas the Sharp B1 bis, you got one gun that's the good hole puncher and the other one's the, the heat chucker. This one, the 75 millimeter gun's just better all around. Um, it's, it's your better gun. Uh, it can penetrate armor better than the 37 millimeter and it can throw high explosive, but um, it's got to be mounted in the hull, which of course creates problems as far as the height of the vehicle. It's pretty hard to be in a hull-down position when your gun's in the hull. Um, but, you know, for 1941, when these things start sort of going into production and then are sent to the, the desert, um, seeing combat and what, uh, they are, you know, it's it's a fairly reliable vehicle. It has a 75 millimeter gun, which is more than any of the British tanks could boast, and it did a pretty good job um, as a sort of emergency, emergency stopgap vehicle. So, the M3. And, of course, the last one would, of course, be the British attempt at a two-gun tank, which was the very early Churchill Mark Ones. And this, you can see it right there. So it's got the three-inch howitzer in the hull, and then the two-pounder in the turret. And this one is very much, um, also, like the Lee, it's an emergency tank, but it's a brand new tank. So whereas the Lee is kind of an emergency upgrade of the M2, just to have something better, this is the British need to design infantry tank better than the Matilda, um, and they very quickly create this, and... You know, what's strange about it is that hull mounting is so not optimized. It, it really does just look like it, a machine gun belongs there. I mean, it's just like every other British tank has that sort of flat um, glacy plate in the front, and it's just you have a driver and a machine gunner. You know, so the, the cannon is it's kind of a goofy-looking thing, and it didn't work well because it had terrible elevation. So I know on some of these early ones, there's even examples where they switched them, where they put the 3-inch the, the howitzer in the turret and the 2-pounder in the hull because at least then the howitzer would get decent elevation. Um, but of course the real solution was just to design a bigger turret for it. If you could fit the, you know, you could fit a six pounder or a QF-75 or even a, I think some of the first 75 millimeter guns in, in Italy, they just literally took the Sherman mantlet and put it in the Churchill turret. Um, so for the British, uh, 
Yeah, you know, early 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 war British tank design is just a mad scramble to come up with something because they're sort of in a desperate straits in, in the early part of the war. So, in, in a way, the French one is the only one that was like an intentional choice, <laughs> but it was one that was made, you know, in the 1920s and just sort of stuck around. So it was just, you know, back in the period where people really didn't have a very clear idea of what tank design should look like. Uh, so... You kind of give the French a pass on that one. The the the, the British and American vehicles were, they're, they're definitely emergency measures. The only other examples I can think of, I don't have a model of an Italian M11 slash 39, you know, where I, had the, I think there was a 37 millimeter gun in the hull and, and a machine gun or two in the turret. Uh, that one doesn't count, though, because it, it doesn't even have a second cannon. It's just machine guns. It's a light little thing. Um, the only other example I could think of was, and this is really going off the rails, the Japanese Type 5. So this never went into production, of course. It was a heavy tank. And it's the weirdest one, because this is late war. They've got a big turret. They've got a big gun. And then where any sane people would put a machine gun in the hull, they put a 37mm cannon. Like, what are you thinking? What are you going to use that on? Like, it's it's 1945. The Americans are not going to be invading the homeland with M3 light tanks. They're going to be coming with Shermans and Pershings and, and, and you know, things that your 37mm gun in the hull isn't going to be much use against, and it's not going to work much against an infantry either. I don't get it. I also, you know, there's not really enough information about Japanese World War II tanks uh, beyond just sort of the basics to understand what their sort of thought processes was, especially on these late war things that never went into production. Um, so I guess that's the end of my rant for tonight on tanks with gun, two guns, two gun tanks, two cannon tanks, I guess I should say. So, um, uh, you know, let me know what you think, if you think I'm completely wrong, or if you, if I totally missed a vehicle, because I, I, you know, there's so many different World War II tanks, it's, it's hard to remember all uh, what was out there. So, let me know, and like I said, keep an eye out this weekend. Hopefully there'll be another uh, Tanks of World War II video. So we'll catch you on the next one. Thank you.